like you to look in the book of Romans with me, the Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, I'd like to begin reading at verse 12. When you consider Romans, Romans is regarded as Paul's treatise of the gospel. And the question obviously is, and I think we have talked about this before and I will reiterate, when the question is asked, how is Romans regarded as gospel, particularly and especially because it does not have the characteristics of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Romans does not give us the historical and the geographical event of Jesus Christ. It has no description of him moving in any particular place at any particular time. It has no description of him operating in Galilee or in Nazareth or Jerusalem. So how could it be defined as the gospel? When you look at the Gospels, you understand that they deal with the historicity and the geographical location of Jesus Christ. And what that does is it proves his humanity. Because every one of us live in a particular time in history and, on, and in a certain geographic location, and that's what makes us human. Believe it or not, you will not be here forever and ever. All of us have a particular lifespan, and all of us have an expiration date. To prove the humanity of Jesus then, he had to exist within the parameters of a certain time, and he had to operate in a geographic location, and that shows his humanity. When you understand that, then you realize that Jesus did not travel as far as I have. He did not go more than a hundred miles from where he was born. I went around the world in eight days. Mm -hmm. So it indicates then just how human he was and the gospels give us the Christ event. So, we're still asking the question, how does Romans fit as gospel? What happens in Romans is it does not deal with the geographic location nor the historical period in which Jesus lives. What it does actually is it gives us the behind the scenes operation of the life of Jesus Christ. Doesn't tell us or describe how and where and what he did. It simply describes why he did it. So what you end up happening now is you end up looking not at the description of his history, but you're looking at the theological philosophy that is and surrounds the gospel. If I may take it further, I would tell you that you will not see propitiation, reconciliation, adoption, sanctification, justification in the historical presentation of Jesus Christ. But it is there justification, propitiation, reconciliation, adoption, everything that is significant to the gospel is seen in Romans. So Romans is called the treatise of the gospel because it makes a presentation of those philosophical, theological truths that you cannot find in the historical presentation. I hope that wasn't too verbose. It's critical to understand then that when Paul opens up in the book of Romans, what he does is his first step is to deliver the doctrine of condemnation. 
So he opens one barrel of the shotgun against mankind in general. And he says, you did not want to obtain or to maintain, or a better word would be to retain God in your knowledge. So because you didn't want to retain God in your knowledge, what God did was give you a mind that cannot retain anything that's proper. He said, so you want to put me on trial and you want to see whether you want to worship me. Well, I tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a mind that cannot worship anything. So consequently, he gives all mankind a reprobate mind. He then turns the other barrel of the shotgun on the Jewish people. And he said, you had the Pentateuch, you had the Torah, you had the law, you had a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. You had the prophets, you had the poets, you had everything that anybody could have. And you still didn't serve God. Uh huh. So by chapter number three, he says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He then introduces justification because you cannot preach justification if you don't first begin with condemnation. He has to bring each one of us to the point where we understand that by ourselves we cannot meet or greet or walk with God. He has to bring us to the place where we throw up our hands and say, I can't do this by myself. I need a move of God. And the significant thing is that none of us could come except the Father draw. Uh, I, I, I might holler today, Patrick. Where, where, where is Patrick? Uh, 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 mm -hmm. It's a critical thing because now he can move into the doctrine of justification. And when you deal then with the doctrine of justification, he begins it in chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. We come to five now and just wanted to bring you up to speed so that we can understand the significance of justification. Justification is just very simply, just as if I have never sinned. It has nothing to do with my behavior. It has all to do with my positioning. Can I say that again? Uh, my righteousness is as filthy rags. So no matter how good I try to be, I cannot be good enough to meet God's requirement until God does something in me. And so consequently, he has to bring me to the place where I understand I need a savior and in order to do that he has to make me so helpless in my reprobacy that I come to realize that without him I can do nothing so Paul in preaching or in presenting the power of justification he has to bring us to a simple idea that's called grace and here's what he does in chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, interesting now, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Mm -hmm. Now we got a problem. If sin is not imputed where there is no law, so why is there death? 
Mm -hmm. Maybe I ought to teach this. Oh, I changed my mind about Holly. Uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Moses is the one who brought the law. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. So how is it then that death is reigning from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous moreover the law entered that the offense may abound but where sin abounds Grace did much more abound. I want you to look at your neighbor like you're angry with him. And say, neighbor, I'm saved by any means necessary. Ooh, I feel like shouting already. The question you have to ask yourself is how far is God prepared to go? And you can find the answer somewhere in God's capacity. Conceptually and illustratively, what the Bible is all about is giving us an insight as to how far God is willing to go. And that's what Paul does in presenting to all the Gentiles. He expresses indeed and in fact the magnificent control and enormous capacity for God to find solutions to our dilemmas and because he wants to save us, the Bible gives us an enormous display of what God wants to do because he wants to do. I remember somewhere where the Bible says it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. So God then in his creative power could have walked away from his creatures and he could have put together a whole nother system. But because it is his pleasure to give us the kingdom and to show us a side of him that we would never know 
if we had not fallen under the sin of one man, Adam. How far is God prepared to go? He's prepared to take any one of us who believes on him from the guttermost to the uttermost. When I deal with the concept that he saves to the uttermost, that word comes from the Greek word pantele. And it means that he's prepared to take you to complete perfection, prepared to take you to that place that completely reverses any curse that had ever existed in your lineage. What God is saying essentially is, I will take you from the worst place that you could ever be and bring you to the best place that you could ever achieve. And it's not by your power, but by my power. It's not by your choice, but by my choice. Because none of us would choose God. If you check Romans chapter 1, you will find very succinctly that no man seeketh after God, no man goes for anything that is righteous. So if an individual walks in here today with a testimony of being saved, the only testimony you could really have is, I am a sinner saved by grace. Ah, I, I want to digress just a minute. I'm doing this message because next week I want to move into Hebrews chapter 4. And I can't actually do Hebrews chapter 4 by the grace of God unless I preface it with this particular word. And the reason I'm telling you that is because many of us don't understand how wonderful it is to be in a place of grace. Because what grace says is you don't deserve to be here. Uh, uh -huh. One of the problems we're having today in a very toxic Christian environment is that when I look on the internet, I see everybody blasting everybody and they're making money doing it. Anytime you see 245,000 views or you see 50,000 views on YouTube, somebody's being paid. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. So the problem with Christianity is that many of the people who are blasting people can only get paid by blasting people because they don't have anything positive to say because they can't get paid by being positive. They only get paid by tearing other people down. But whoever is tearing the other person down does not deserve to have the right to tear anybody down because everybody who is in the house of God or in the body of Christ only got there because of grace. And grace means you don't deserve to be here. So how can I put somebody out of a place that I don't deserve to be in myself? I feel something happening here. Uh, uh, oh, yes, indeed. So let me just work it out. I am saying that because next week I want to talk about rest. And I want to talk about all of you who are in the prisons and everywhere else in the house of God who are working so hard to get your salvation together. You are working so hard to prove that you are so righteous. But your righteousness does not come from you. Your righteousness comes from God. And that's why next week I just want to deal with rest. 
Rest because you're not the one that's working out your salvation. Rest because you don't know that where you are right now is where God wants you to be. You don't know that your failures have become a tool in God's hands to deliver you out of a situation that you couldn't deliver yourself out of so that he might get the glory in your life. Uh, I want to tell people rest. Stop staying up all night over some things you can't change. Rest. Stop trying to fix something that is out of your hands. Rest. Rest on your knees giving glory to God and calling on him to deliver you from the situation. Rest because Satan can't do any more to you than God will allow him to do. And when it's over, uh, he'll give you double for your trouble. And so when I look then at chapter 5 and verse 12 through 21, he reaches literally back to Romans 3, 18 through 20, where the subject now deals with total depravity is discussed. The conditions then of Romans 3, 18 through 20 can be contributed to a source. How did we get to the place of total depravity? And the conditions then bring that some thing have set off the mechanics for these conditions. That is, when God created man, these conditions did not exist in the pristine quality of his creative power. When he put Adam together in innocence, the depravity did not exist. Something set it off. And here is what he says. He says, sin and death came from Adam. And when he says here in that particular text, the word here is cosmos. When sin came into the world and the world is cosmos. And what he's saying here is the same word that's used in John 3.16. For God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only begotten son. In the cosmos, we're talking about everybody. In the cosmos, we're talking about every kind. In the cosmos, we're talking about a world full of dying people. A world full of being going to death the moment you are born. What in the world set off such a negative mechanism when God made man and showered him with the wonders of the Garden of Eden? And the answer is so much goes bad because somebody set off the negative in my life. I came into a world that was rotten. I came into a world that was already broken, but God did not make a broken world. And yet still, I have come into the world without any of my doing, only to find from the moment I am born to the moment I am dead, that man is born of, and has a few days, and the few days is full of trouble. I am affected, but I am infected. And all around me, there are infected and affected people. I can find anybody who is good because he already declared. No one is good, no, not one. And so the question is, how did it get so bad? 
I went over into the New Testament and I took a look in the Gospels at the man who was by the pool. And the pool symbolizes the situation that I am in. Why? Because he is in a pool and the pool is called the house of mercy. But he received no mercy in the house of mercy because people who were less sick than he was got to the water before he did. Now can you imagine that? That I am sick and somebody who is less sick, it would seem to me like you would let the people who are more sick uh, get to the water. But even the sick who are trying to be healed are selfish enough to forget those who are more sick. If there is only one of us that's going to be healed, we're going to fight to get to the water. Isn't that the way life is? People are always fighting because no matter how bad I am, I still have an egocentrical, um, yes, I have an attitude that I need it for myself. So not only are we sick, we're fighting each other and each one of us is sick. And I am infected and affected because I have a world that is totally depraved. And in the middle of all of that depravity, there's the house of mercy. But it's bad when I have to fight even in the house of mercy. So what's going on here? Because God did not put a world together that was sick. Well, sin originated with the angel called Lucifer who in rebelling against God contracted a sinful nature. Now here's what he does. And, and I have you told have I told you touch your neighbor yet? All right, it's coming. Uh, now here's what he does. Anytime Satan shows up, he is sin and he has been the originator of sin. So now the interesting thing is how is it that God could be there in heaven and sit back and allow Satan to take a third of the angels with him? Now I want you to see this picture very carefully. It had to be a plan because God is all powerful yet he does not impede on free will. He is powerful and he is all powerful and he is almighty but if he decides to intercept your behavior and stop you from doing what he knows you're going to do that is wrong and against him if he stepped in every time and stopped you from doing what is against him you would no longer have free will uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. can I go over that again you see free will says choose me or don't choose me but when you don't choose God, remember you can't receive life like you chose him. Um, I feel some pushing me. I'm trying to behave. You see, if you don't choose God, don't you look for blessings to follow you when you haven't chosen the blessor. If you choose to go against God, then the only thing that's going to follow you is a curse. I feel like preaching now. You see, when Satan chose to rebel against God, God could have stopped him in his tracks. Ah, I say like I heard on TV some years ago, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Well, anything that God created, he can move out because a created being is ephemeral. A created being is not eternal, it's ephemeral, which means I can bring you in, I can take you out. The only eternal being 
being that never came in and can't go out is God himself. He's got the power to dis disintegrate anything and everything that he has created. It's critical now to understand that Satan is a spoiler because he was thrown out of heaven and Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I'm talking about quick. You stand against God and your demise will be quick. I read somewhere where he said, I'll cut you off and that without remedy when God gets ready to move you out there is nothing that can keep you in I feel like shouting on that maybe I shouldn't so Adam now picks up the same attitude because of the spoiler and what Adam does is he now rebels against God in the same way that disobedience becomes rebellion rebellion against God and when you rebel against God you've got to live with the consequences of that rebellion now what Adam didn't know consciously was that his rebellion and disobedience is not only going to affect him but his disobedience is now going to affect everybody that follows him. If you notice very carefully, and I'm rushing through here, if you notice very carefully that when God made Adam, he made him in his own image. But when Cain was born and Abel was born, they had something in them when they were born that Adam did not have in him when he was created. When Adam was created, he was not created with sin, but he disobeyed God, and in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. So what Adam did was introduce death through disobedience. Uh, I feel the Holy Spirit here. And because he introduced death through disobedience, he gave something in his DNA to his children that he didn't have in his pristine creation. I feel the Holy Spirit. So now all of a sudden, the little word Greek here says that thus unto all men death came throughout. It didn't come because of the declaration of the law. It came because of the behavior of Adam. I want to talk to every person who's head of their house. I need you to raise your hands. And if you have somebody under you, raise your hands. Is there somebody in your house that's depending on you? Raise your hands. Now understand this. If you mess up, you are not only going to affect yourself, but you're going to affect everybody who's depending on you. Can I talk about being a pastor for a minute? There are many things I would like to do. I could have gone to a wonderful celebration this last weekend. I would have ended up being with a whole lot of wonderful, significant people that you like on the quiet, <laughs> that you enjoy in your house on the quiet, that you laugh with, that you fall out with. <laughs> but I decided based on the toxicity of our day <laughs> that maybe I don't need to be seen on any kind of social media platform with any Thing that's questionable in the time in which we live. I hope those of you who are wise enough understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. When you are in the position I am in, you cannot only think of yourself, but you have to give thought about the people who are depending 
on who you are. When you put people in position, they should be honest, they should be straightforward, they should be reliable because people are only looking at you because you affect what they do. If you run your house, somebody ought to know where you are. If you're in charge of your house, somebody ought to be able to find you. When you tell your wife or whoever you're with that I'm man enough to be where I am and I ain't got to say anything to anybody here, well, you ain't running nothing. Because if you're running something, somebody ought to be able to reach you. Because you you don't only affect yourself you affect your children's 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 children and blessings ought to begin with you not curse Adam curse me uh, I feel like shouting here uh, I was mad with Adam when I was growing up uh, because they said to me you got to go to church today I said why uh, I haven't done anything they said well Adam did it for you uh, so you better get your little ugly self up and get your clothes on and get to church uh, you see death then entered and it affects all men and it spread through the announcement of any sickness is an announcement of death I got news for you the announcement of birth is the announcement of death because death is just a matter of time and the pronouncement of death is on because we die everybody's got to die Paul said all have sinned so all are affected of death by death but Adam is the federal head of the race so when he sinned all humanity sinned in him Paul demonstrates this fact and this is how he does it he says until the law was given and I'm in the text uh, during the period between Adam and Moses sin was in the world but a funny thing is happening. Sin is not imputed or it is not put to the account of the person when there is no law. So nobody should be dying because there is no law. So there is no account of sin. Yet because of Adam, sin reigned as king. Why is it happening to me? What did I do to deserve this in my family? I've been cursed because of someone else's behavior. I want to talk to somebody here who needs to get over people. There are some folk you need to get over because you don't need to be around some people who are cursed. Can I talk to you for a minute? Every now and then you got to look at what's following you. Because if you look at what's following you, you will find out who you are with. If you follow the Lord, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Then let me tell you what's going to happen. Goodness and mercy shall follow you. If you look behind you and you don't see goodness and mercy, you better check who you with. Because when you're with cursed people, you'll end up being cursed. If you run with dark people, you'll end up being dark. And let me tell you something, if you're an eagle, don't fly too low. Because eagles only get in trouble when they go low. I feel a little church coming on. Uh, have I told you touch your neighbor yet? It's on the way. Uh, I, I feel like preaching here. Uh, uh, I'm not calling for Pat. Pat had to go. Uh, all right, Bennett. Uh, it's true then that Adam becomes the destructive force uh, because he is the preeminent negative influence upon the whole human race. Uh, he becomes that 
anthropos. That's the Greek word for figure. And it's a sense of a type. It's a person or thing prefiguring a future person or thing. Adam now becomes a tupas. And let me tell you how wonderful God is. Touch your neighbor and say, God is wonderful. Uh -huh, that's the first time. I want to show you how wonderful God is. God looks at the overall picture. And here's what he says. He says, I'm looking at Adam. And Adam is a destructive force. But I'm not going to throw him out as an illustration of what I'm getting ready to do. Adam brought sin in the world unintentionally. But Jesus is going to bring power in the world intentionally. I feel like preaching in here. Uh huh. You can find the devil will put you in a place where you make mistakes. But I'm telling you, God will put you in a place where you make blessings. I feel like preaching. I feel like lifting him up. The devil will put you in a place where you don't know what next to do. But God's word is a light and a lamp to your feet and he'll give you the discernment to know how to operate. He'll show you who to talk to. He'll show you who to put aside. He'll show you who to lift up and he'll show you who to put down. What the devil causes you to do by mistake, God causes you to do it by intention. I feel like giving God some praise. Touch your neighbor and say, my life is not happenstance. My life is directed by the God of my salvation. I'm not here today because of a mistake. I'm here today because of destiny. God has ordained it. God has declared it. What God did now was look at Adam. And he said, I'm not going to throw it away. But I'm going to use Adam as a type of Christ. I'm going to show mankind that in the same way Adam mess things up it's in the same way that I'm gonna fix it up I'm talking to everybody in the prison and I'm saying to all of you there Satan got you there and you made a mess or a mistake in your life but God's gonna bring you out in the same way Satan put you in except Satan did it with intention to destroy but the Lord is going to do it with intention to give a life I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly can I preach like I feel it give your neighbor a high five and said we fell aside because of Satan but what on track because of Jesus I'm gonna give you a free gift and that gift is a gift of faith and even though you're down and out I'm gonna show you favor I feel like preaching it. folk talk about favor can I tell you what favor is it's something you don't deserve don't you walk up in here and act like you are somebody special huh? the only special person in here is God Almighty and when he said by one man sin entered into the world by one man I'm going to deliver man by one man the curse came upon everybody but by one man I'm going to deliver everybody by one one man death reign but by one man blessings are going to rain rain in my life rain like a king give some money high five for the third time and say neighbor 
blessings are going to reign in your life not because you're the best person but because Jesus Jesus came into your life when he came into my life he turned it around turn you around one time turn around two times turn around three times give somebody a high five said I've been turned around I've been turned by the glory of God how much more I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore singing deep deep in sin never to rise no more but this of the sea my distressing cry from the water lifted me now save save am I give somebody high fives say by any means necessary by any means necessary he brought me out of a bad marriage by any means necessary he took the devils off my back told me to shake it off let the devil take it back by any means necessary he'll whip you he'll spank you he'll turn you life upside down but when it's over he's gonna draw you and bless you give somebody a high five and say neighbor my children are blessed because of Jesus my grandchildren are blessed my home is blessed my car is blessed my life is blessed my soul is blessed my spirit is blessed he did it He did it, he did it, by any means necessary. He hung on the cross. He hung on the cross. They nailed him in the sand. Nailed him through the intimate tonsils. I'm saved, I'm saved. Somebody ought to praise him. Somebody said, thank God for grace by any means. Who in here? Who in here can declare? I shouldn't be here. Is there anybody that knows for a fact? Bring me that chair. If it hadn't been for Jesus. And the Lord on my side. I shouldn't be here. I have no judgments to make. I have no place to put anybody down or put anybody out because I don't deserve to be here myself. And as I extend the word to everyone under the sound of my voice, Grace humbles us because to receive his grace we have to admit to ourselves that I'm not good 
And the only goodness I have is what he has given me. He saw my weakness and he knew I couldn't bring anything to the table that was worth him having. So he said, okay, since you can't bring anything that's good to me, I will make it a requirement that you have to be weak in order to receive me. You have to not deserve it. That's why he says, where sin doth abound, and I want to talk to you who are incarcerated where sin doth abound grace doth much more abound don't give up on yourself because God has not given up on you and he says I'm gonna get you out into the place of salvation if you never come out of that prison I'm going to save you in there by any means necessary and Calvary is the by any means necessary if you're in this building I want you to come if you're anywhere under the sound of my voice if you're watching from all over the world Grace and where you are right now, sweet grace, and something says, Come to God. I want you to come right now. I need you to call 844 267 7729. Come on, come on pick up your phone right now pick up your phone if you're in this building and you're not born again I need you to come this way come this way come this way young man young lady middle-aged person doesn't matter what you are who you are come on come on come on come on the blood has not lost its power come on Come on, he's called. Grace of God. Come on. Come on. 844-267-7729. I need somebody praising God. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Somebody's picking up the phone. Pick it up. Pick it up. God is moving you. Pick it up. Pick it up. 844-267-7729 Pick it up And talk Grace Of God Sweet Grace Of God That brought me And told me Grace Everybody standing all over this place. 